five mentoring challenges as an older. Yes. What would happen if we were to take a look at mentoring through the continuum of younger, older, elder? And take a look at the possible challenges that may arise in that situation. That's what I wanted to share with you today because mentoring is one of 12 education approaches that are available to you. And if you take it to the foreground and use it, you will find it to be very helpful. And there are important reasons for that, which I will share uh, a little bit later. But I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming to this presentation with at least 30 plus years of mentoring, facilitative mentoring. Now, I was doing it prior because I'm now in my 70s. So 30 years back, 40s, I was certainly using it in my 20s and 30s as well. But I think that's what's important here is my awareness of my mentoring really came to the foreground when I was in my 40s and I was doing a lot of my deeper, richer consulting work at that point in time with team development and organization culture. And what that did was it led me to understand the following, that for me to really appreciate mentoring, I had to understand these key words, reciprocal and holistic. In other words, mentoring is a two-way for personal and professional uh, development, even for youngers uh, who acquire a mentor or they mentor through peer mentoring. There is a personal professional connection there. And by being reciprocal, you also open up the possibility of understanding that all things are connected and therefore mentoring brings out this access to all things connected. And when you understand that from a head, heart and hands perspective and bring that into the um, mentoring arrangement, mentoring relationship, what you're able to do is get to a place of where it is a relevant conversation that allows you to be wonderful. <laughs> In other words, you find the openness, the trust, the respect to open up opportunities and potentials um, for wandering around in the questions that are being asked for the collaborative conversation that you're having so that you can figure out what is relevant because sometimes it requires looking at something from a completely different angle that you go, ah, okay, I see something a little bit different here. And also, uh, this is sometimes a point that's lost on those who are younger, older, but as you move into older, elder, you pick up on this, is that mentoring is really about well-being uh, to assist the unique journey of the mentee and yourself as a mentor, but also looking at, because you're bringing these two unique journeys together, it's about the well-living that you're sharing in this adventure together. And therefore, these key words I would keep forefront in your mind, in your head, hands, and heart, so that you can tap into them when necessary, when you're faced with some of the challenges that I'm going to share with you. Now, before we dive deep into this, I would like to mention that you can edit what I'm sharing here because you can add, alter, or delete something that is said, uh, an idea that's given, uh, a tool, technique that's being used, and you can edit it. That's one of the great things about presentations like this is that it seems that these are challenges and these are responses to deal with those challenges. And you can consider and look at the suggestions and go, hmm, okay, not sure I'd like that one for the situation I'm in, but I'll take that and adapt it. That's the edit aspect of this. So please enjoy and um, take notes and then figure out what you want to work with. So we will be going over the five challenges and they are 
misaligned outcomes, conversation barriers, <laughs> lack of commitment, overstepping boundaries, and social cultural misunderstanding. So these challenges are ones that I faced over that 30 plus years of facilitative mentoring. So I'm gonna be pulling some experiences into my sharing here with you. Before we dive into these five challenges, I just want to remind you, comment and subscribe. That'd be wonderful. But in particular, comment because of that editing that you might be doing, you may come up with ideas. And if you put them in the comments, I can learn with you. And that would be fabulous. Now, when it comes to the mentoring challenges as an older, the first one is the sense of misaligned outcomes. Now, what I want to do here is there is the unique journey that each of us are on, mentee mentor, and therefore we have goals that we set for ourselves. In our adventure together, by working together, there are outcomes that we share. And if we're clear about those outcomes, that really helps us to understand what is possible, what can unfold here. Because if there is misalignment around the outcomes and we really haven't chatted about them and brought them to the foreground as defining them, agreeing to those terms, things will start to get a little bit murky and mucky and that isn't going to be of great assistance. Now, when I was doing my work with the mergers and acquisitions, because we were bringing different departments together, different groups and teams together, often they had their own language and their own way of going about setting up goals for themselves and therefore the shared outcomes for the group or team. And what we had to do was we had to get them to present them in such a way is that both parties or more than one party, two parties, three parties, could understand where each of the others were coming from so that we could figure out what would be then a shared approach to the creation of outcomes that would be set up for the merger acquisition and then afterwards. It took a little bit of time and effort because to get those agreement, we sometimes hold on to our, <laughs> our outcomes um, sometimes a little too long and that was the case with a couple of groups teams so there was a, a few laggard teams uh, and groups that we had to interact with but at the same time it became kind of an interesting because what it did was it gave them an opportunity to really start to understand each other in a much um, i'll use this words quite off deeper and richer way because it helped them to figure out statements about what do we require and request of each other as shared outcomes. Require is no wiggle room. Request, ah, there's some wiggle room here and let's take a look at it from that perspective. And what it also did was it encouraged us to do regular check-ins because as a mentor to them to be able to take the insights from uh, the cultural assessment that had been done, bringing it through the notion of shared outcomes. I was mentoring different managers and leaders to make sure that they brought it all together, that they found some sense of alignment amongst all of them, which is what I was just been hinting at here. So this first one is make sure that the outcomes, the shared outcomes, the adventure together are clear for everyone who's involved and that there is a sense of agreement that comes into that. The next one is conversation barriers. And this is one that comes up in just about every setting in which I worked over the years. And I did some really great international work as well in um, Australia, China, uh, different parts of Africa and communication. <laughs> always seem to bubble to the surface. 
And I said to myself, why is that? And then I went and looked at the word and I said, oh, I see it here. It's the level of commonness that unifies us into action. That's what communication is about. And conversation is to have, have the ability to convert, to have conversions, to have conversations with one another. And it leaned into the misalignment outcomes that I just mentioned, but it was also barriers that got set up because people said, okay, this is how I prefer to interact. And a lot of people would say, I so enjoy meeting together. Great. Others said, no, send me a letter, send me an email, and um, I'll get back to you from that perspective. And so sometimes the barriers got in and what happened was they blocked that movement, that conversation. And if you're seeking collaborative conversation where you're both uh, assertive and cooperative collaboration, and you're having the conversations to be able to work together, if there's barriers there, then that can sort of, in a sense, deflect you off and cause angst. And when that starts to creep in, then it starts to fall apart and you don't want any of that to have um, an impact on it. So if you remain open and you're wholehearted in your approach to your conversations, this collaborative approach, then often the barriers will disappear. But when it does appear, then make sure you express your thoughts and concerns and you identify the elephant in the room. <laughs> and I have to do that a couple of times. And one of those was in a, a program that I was doing around leadership in Ethiopia. And I was helping a group of um, consultants who were hired in by the bigger company I was working with. And I was educating them in how to educate what it is that I shared with them. So I had to mentor them in their approach and to bring the content alive through the uh, presentations that they were doing. So I actually met them out in the field and I was doing some mentoring. And sometimes what would happen is I could see conversation barriers creeping in when they were making their presentations because they were assuming that the persons that were hearing what they were sharing weren't actually understanding what they were sharing. <laughs> so I had to mentor them in opening up this notion of it's important to take a pause between the presentation of the ideas and then engaging with the persons who are learning with you to figure out if it landed rather than just passing on by and shooting on through and just assuming because it just didn't work. So my mentoring with them opened up the, what I call the credibility pause, that opportunity to just slow down a little bit and give people some room to reflect, think through what was just shared. So that was a really great example of overcoming that barrier, making sure that the conversations could flow and therefore the communication, the level of commonness that unifies that group together into action actually took place. And a year later, I heard from some of them about how important that item was to them because they started to use it in their own mentoring approach. And I was um, here at home uh, reading through and I just went, yes, <laughs> that's great. That's, that's how we want this to happen. The next one I want to look at is lack of commitment. And this has happened to me a couple of times, and I mentioned a couple of times, which they really expanded and became issues for the mentee interacting with me. It doesn't happen very often because I'm setting things up so we don't have misaligned outcomes and conversation barriers and the other ones that I'll be chatting with you, because I really go at this notion of commitment and helping the mentee through our conversations understand what commitment means. Because commitment is made by yourself to yourself 
with an expression that this is what I'm going to commit to have happen. In other words, these are the promises I'm going to keep. And if I find myself in a position where I can't keep it, then I'm going to ask for a recommitment update. But it's really about saying to yourself, I'm going to fulfill the outcomes that we agreed to and my responsibilities to that, my accountability to that, I'm going to be clear. And if there's any waving or that's going to happen around that, then I'm going to acknowledge it from this sense of commitment. And so it didn't happen very often, but the one time, yeah, there was a but there, but one time, for whatever reason, I just couldn't get the person to commit to the work. There was follow-up requirements that they agreed to do, but they always came back in with some kind of uh, an excuse or they talked about some trap they fell into or they got a little angry with me and I had to sort of scratch my head a little bit. Well, okay, what's going on here? We'll step back just a little bit here and find out what's taking place. And it took us almost two months of interacting and myself just being patient and showing discretion and just allowing the person to open up that I found out that their boss, their manager never fulfilled their commitments and in some cases lied to them, but they wouldn't share it with me at the very beginning but once they trusted me enough, they opened up and shared that background story. And I went, ah, now I see what's going on. Now I can help out a little bit more. And what happened was we just got into a really great flow and it happened to end up that uh, we were together for about another six months and it was glorious. It was, it was great. And I actually got a, a wonderful thank you note from that person about how they were able to truly understand what commitment meant and how to deal with commitment situations. And often it's because the outcomes that you've shared are misaligned. You're not fulfilling them and that barriers have crept into the conversations. And if you deal with those, like I've shared with you, then the notion of commitment can flow through the conversation and be present in the relationship and the arrangement. Now, this still requires every once in a while that check-in to find out how well we're both doing. And as a mentor, I have to be upfront enough to give feed forward about where we are with commitment, my own commitments and my interpretation of the commitments they made and expressed to me. And I usually get that in within the first couple of meetings and just touch on it. And then if an example shows up, then I bring it to the foreground and we chat about it through this feed forward system that I interact with and I use. And I just wanna highlight something here. If you're a mentor, and you have to recommit, it's okay. Just make the statement, I have to make a recommitment here to what's going on for whatever reason. Just share it, be open, because that is a way to demonstrate for the mentee what it is that you're sharing with them about what a holistic, reciprocal, relevant mentoring arrangement and relationship is about. So be open to that. That's okay. Overstepping boundaries is the next one I want to take a look at. Now, this is an interesting one because I'm going to go back into my 20s, and I was doing some youth leadership development at the time. I was helping young persons become playground leaders, and I was the one who was managing a group of about 20 of them, and they were in different schools in an after-school program. And I remember this clear as day because when I gave them instructions to help them figure out what to do using an instructive technique, which is another educating approach, 
often they would come back if they got a little frustrated, just tell me what to do. Because what I was asking them to do is make some decisions about how they want to set up their situation with the kids that they were interacting with. And yet some of them would come back and say, just tell me how to set this up and I'll do it according to how you tell me to do it. And guess what? I fell into the trap <laughs> and the first couple of times, and then I went, hang on a minute. They're doing what I'm asking them to do, but I'm not really helping them figure out how they want to set this up. So I went to my senior manager and we had a conversation. So in a sense, we went through a little bit of mentoring and she suggested that I use mentoring. So I learned a little bit about it in a very basic way. And what I did was I had conversations and I didn't give them the how to steps. What we did is we figured out through the conversation and mentoring and asking questions, how to get to the steps they would take so that they could make the decision that was necessary. And I went, great, that's what we want to do. Because I have to understand my scope of mentorship, my mentoring approach that I'm going to use. And I would suggest you do that for yourself is truly understand the scope. What are your boundaries that you are putting around this mentoring arrangement, mentoring relationship? And being able to express that to the mentee and ask the mentee the same thing. What are the boundaries? Is there areas you don't want to get into chatting about? Is there certain things that you don't want me to do? And I bring this one up because um, the co-creator of the international mentoring community we set up, he shares a story about he was sitting in front of a mentee and he pulled out some paper and a pen and he was going to take some notes as he usually did. And the mentee said, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to take some notes. No, you're not. If you are, I'm leaving. Oh, hang on a minute. What, what? Because he forgot to ask or to lay out, can I take some notes? Because I want to just keep track of what's going on. No one else will see them. Making statements like that to the mentee may have taken the edge off of that interaction that they had. And I can remember him sharing that and watching his face. I could still see it interacting with him to this day. And that's where you've got to really appreciate this idea of being clear about the outcomes, being clear about the conversation techniques and tools you're going to use, making sure that you're clear about commitments, yours and the other person's, so that you can understand the boundaries in which you are interacting. And when you do that, then you are leaning into the mentee developing through their own decisions, a growth and development path. That gift is something that will last a lifetime for them. It'll last a lifetime. And again, you will probably end up like I have on occasion, a couple of years later, you get a, a thank you note. Um, I received one from one of the learners that I was interacting with when I worked with um, a university. And what was it? It was almost 12 years later when I got a message that said, your mentoring was fabulous. She probably didn't use fabulous because I tend to use fabulous a lot. But she said, it was on point. You really helped me and it helped me later on in my own work. So sometimes it comes in later, just accept it and thank the person who shared it with you and just be open to those possibilities. So this overstepping boundaries, just be really clear about what the situation is. And if you need to move the boundary around a little bit, ask. Have a chat about it. It's one of the things to uh, to talk about. Share. See what happens. It will all work itself out as it must. 
socio-cultural misunderstandings. Uh, <laughs> this has happened quite a few times because I've done work overseas. And some of the projects were on really interesting topics. And I'm going to share one that was, I encountered it while I was in Uganda. And it was another one that I encountered in Canada. And it was around HIV and AIDS. I was doing health promotion work and education around uh, what was happening. It was at the very early stages of it. And I was developing programs that could be used in the workplace. And with all the myths and misconceptions and misinformation that were flying around at that point in time, I had to particularly pay attention to where I was and the words that I was using so that I didn't contribute to misunderstanding. And therefore, what was it that I could do to ensure this understanding, comprehending, so a person could go through analyzing, synthesizing, getting to the point of valuing what I was sharing. And I remember one point is that I was given the task of doing a presentation in a community. And I got up, did my brief introduction, sat down, the others who were there did their brief introduction. This is how the community wanted it done. But I noticed something. I said, hang on a minute. Why am I, someone from Canada, coming to a village in Uganda and talk about HIV and AIDS and education when my compatriot, my colleague, who I was mentoring, could do it? And so as she was coming back from her introduction, I whispered, you're going to do the presentation. There was a little hesitant in her step, but for some reason she got it. And we had a conversation afterwards and she said, you did that because of who you are, what you've been sharing with me and where we were, you were pulling it all together to make sure that the outcomes and the barriers and the commitment and the boundaries aligned for the benefit of the village. I said, yes. I didn't know it at the time, and we had a really great conversation. And that was one of those times where I went, ah, this is where it all comes together. And I could really appreciate it. And I carried that over into when I did my workplace education around HIV and AIDS and what it meant, because I was in all different kinds of organizations. So a presentation a may not go in workplace D. I had to figure out my presentation for workplace D while still holding the integrity of the content and the practices, but the words that I might use would be a little bit different. And I remember I was asked to give presentations to um, younger um, youth, and so I had to figure that out. Then I was asked to do something at a um, retirement home. So I had to shift it again a little bit. Uh, there's a couple of different kinds of workplaces that had very multicultural organizations. And so all these different sociocultural variables kept popping in and therefore my workplace HIV AIDS health promotion program was framed by the use of mentoring as well. So what I would do is I would help and encourage and interact with those who would do the continuation of the presentation. So I was mentoring them in ways in which to uh, engage with their audiences that they were interacting with. And so what became important to me in all of that, which is now foreground in all my work is the use of the term felt safety, is that I'm looking to make sure that there's safe systems and safer practices in place so that there is this felt safety, the emotional safety, the mental health is taken care of. Because if I counter those or I knock them down, then 
what it is that I'm sharing gets lost. And that's not what I want to ever have happen. So felt safety is now inside me from a preparation, prevention, practice point of view. It weaves itself into everything that I do. So that was a really great outcome of my adventures together with those different audiences that I now use in all of my programming around uh, mentoring as legacy and legacy with mentoring that I would certainly encourage you to think about getting involved with. So as we take a look at these five challenges, the situations that I shared with you, ways in which I dealt with the learnings that I brought forward, here is something that is like a summary point that if you adhere to it or edit it according to your requirements, this will help you. It will be useful. And it's based on the premise of words matter. And there are no absolute words, but the words you're going to use is either going to bring persons in or it's going to send people away. So the key here is whatever it is that you're doing in your mentoring, whatever topic that you're doing, including mentorship mentoring, is define the terms and concepts associated, linked to, in this case, mentorship. But it could be if you're talking about marketing, you're talking about project management, you're, you're talking about starting a new business, you're talking about uh, mental health for youth, then you would make sure that you define the terms and concepts linked to those projects. Then what you do is you agree on the terms and concepts, in this case, linked to med mentorship or the other ones. So you're defining the terms and concepts so you understand what the words mean, because words matter. And then you're going to have a conversation. Do you agree or don't agree? Because if you don't agree, there's still something in there that needs to be thought through, um, have a dialogue about so that you can move forward, in this case, with the mentoring or project management or the marketing, whatever it might be. So pay attention to words matter, define the terms and concepts, agree on those terms and concepts, because often what we do is forget to do the agreement part. We just go, oh, we talked about them. Okay, off we go and we start moving forward. Guess what happens? You come back to the first one. <laughs> it happens every time. If you don't define the terms and concepts and agree on them, and if you just start moving forward, you will come back and have a conversation about them because they will get into one of the challenges that we just shared that you listen to, I shared. <laughs> you're going to edit the way to deal with it. Then what you're going to do is repeat this process for each topic covered during mentoring or project managing, marketing, however it is that you're using. So I wanted to just give that to you because that was one of the major learning points for me. Again, that I weave into everything that I do. And if there's any place in my world where I still slip up is I still sometimes use words that are not really understood by the audience and I don't always pick up on it. And I'm getting better at it because I like to play with words. And sometimes I play with the word to the extent that I confuse. <laughs> and as a mentor, Oh, being uh, someone who confuses the mentee, that's not helpful. That brings about the mentoring challenges that we just shared. So from a deep resonance for me and I share with you, take this one to heart, hands and head, and make it work for you. As we move to closing out, I would suggest the following. Go back to YouTube or go to YouTube or wherever you are watching this video, get to YouTube at Mentor Practices. There are a series of really wonderful videos that is looking at mentoring from different angles. And usually every week, two weeks, we put up a new video on that channel. 
And also you can consider certification. If that's something that you'd like to have a bit of a discussion about with me, then you can use the links that are in the description around this video. If not, it's at wealthmovement.com, W-E-L-L-T-H, movement.com, forward slash contact, reach out, and we can have a conversation. Again, that address is in the description as well. Thank you for visiting with me on this topic of five mentoring challenges as an older. My stories were to bring uh, tips and tools together for you to go with the technique of mentoring. I would encourage you have been doing it probably yourself. So go back into your experiences of education over the years and see where you have done some mentoring and pull it all together because it is a natural way in which to support others as an older, whether it's youngers, uh, other olders, elder interactions, and enjoy yourself while you're doing it. Take care. Want to remind you, comment and subscribe. That'd be wonderful. But in particular, comment because of that editing that you might be doing, you may come up with ideas. And if you put them in the comments, I can learn with you. And that would be fabulous. So thanks for that.